Hi, hey, welcome to the Living with Disability Research Centre uh, monthly seminar. This is our seminar for October. Um, just want to start off by acknowledging um, the lands, that the, the traditional owners of the land on which I am at the moment in Bandura in Melbourne, who are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, if you haven't joined us before, the seminar is recorded um, and the slides will be available together with the recording on our website um, usually by the end of the week or early next week. Um, if you want to use the captions, just press show captions. Um, if you want to put any questions, uh, ask any questions, make any comments, please put them in the Q&A and we'll deal with them when, when the speakers have, have finished talking and we'll have a discussion using your questions. So please put your questions and comments in the Q&A. So this afternoon, we've got two speakers on the theme around supporting decision-making choice and rights. And our first speaker is Jenna McNabb, uh, who those of you who are from New South Wales will know, she's been a long-term person in the New South Wales public servant. She's a, a lawyer and has been very involved in issues around capacity and rights for people with disabilities. And she's uh, she's completed her PhD. It's currently under examination, um, which is about um, the, how the New South Wales public guardians make decisions uh, with the people that they're appointed to make decisions on behalf of. And it's been a it's a it's a really really interesting grounded theory study. So I'm going to hand over to Jenna, who's going to walk you through some of her findings. So over to you, Jenna. Hi everyone. Um, I just noticed how red my face is, so that <laughs> that will at least disguise if I get all flustered. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, also that I'm on Darawa land today, um, and thank you for the acknowledgement to country, Chris. Um, so I've um, titled my presentation "Crossing the Great Divide" because it's looking at how um, New South Wales public servants actually make decisions in two competing environments. Um, and frameworks. I just want to let you know the presentation overview um, will start with the thesis topic um, aim and methodology. We'll just look at that quickly. And then I want to talk about some background concepts that are very relevant to the grounded theory um, that I'll talk about later in the presentation. Um, I'll look at the grounded theory generally and then um, talk about, so, so the grounded theory is about um, the human rights substitute decision-making outcome typology, a really a long name for a simple structure. Um, it comprises of four decision-making outcome types, and I'll talk about each of those for about five minutes and then move on to implications. Um, so my thesis topic, as Chris said, was about understanding the substitute decision-making process and practice of New South Wales guardians, and that's in the context of Article 12 of the United Nations um, Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, so the UNCRPD. Um, the background to this is that Australia has obligations to comply with Article 12, um, whose man of the UNCRPD, and the mandate of Article 12 is um, to ensure the equality of legal capacity for people with disability. Um, and it also um, asks states to provide support um, for people to exercise that legal capacity, which translates um, to supported decision-making in the main. Um, but do we do this? That's what we're looking for. Um, that's what I was looking at in my thesis. And the committee's view, so the UNCRPD's committee's view, is that Australia doesn't comply. And that's looking at the legislation, so the text of the legislation um, suggests that we don't comply with Article 12, but this is looking at law on the books. So the thesis aim then was to look beyond this, so to look beyond the theoretical prescription of the Guardianship Act um, to understand what the everyday practice of guardians look like 
um, when making substitute decisions for people. Um, and also the second aim was to look at whether this practice actually aligns with key elements of our obligations under Article 12 of the UNCRPD and to what degree they actually align with Article 12, if at all. Um, the idea was that this will give us a realistic baseline of practice from which from where we can understand what we then need to do to move further towards alignment with Article 12 and to implement that um, on a practical level. So we'll be looking at number two um, today, which is how practice aligns with key elements of Article 12. Um, this is the very complicated diagram which depicts um, grounded theory, which is um, the methodology that I used in my thesis. Um, I guess what I mainly want to um, say today is that grounded theory is about not about how many people are interviewed, but it's about um, getting some thick description from those participants. And this is achieved through something called theoretical saturation, which is um, more information about that is in the notes to the slide. So you can probably look at that later or you can ask me about that in question time or at a later date because um, I don't want to spend too much time on that because there's so much else to get through. So who, <clears throat> who did I interview? So I interviewed seven um, New South Wales public guardians and they were from all three of the public guardians' offices in New South Wales. And this meant that they covered nine um, out of 10 New South Wales regions. Um, I didn't look at um, the southern region of New South Wales, but all um, so that the locations that I did have guardians um, come from it included regional, rural, and remote um, areas. So Data collection was done using purposive sampling, which meant that it was an intentional type of sampling of participants, which was looking for public guardians who had experience um, of substitute decision making. And I used the criteria of having 12 months experience or more. Um, and this allowed me to pick up on public guardians caseloads um, that included a whole range, um, diverse range of demographics of people. And this included people with um, cognitive disability, so intellectual disability, traumatic brain injury, and also people with mental health issues um, and people who have dementia. Um, so recruitment was via an email to the New South Wales Office of Public Guardian, which the CEO then distributed, um, and uh, participants then contacted me. Participation was voluntary. Um, so how did I collect data? So what data was collected? I did one-on-one -on -one, um, semi-structured interviews, which lasted from about 50 minutes to two hours, and they were conducted at the offices of public guardians so that guardians were more comfortable in that environment. And um, the written interviews I transcribed, and these were the basis of the data um, that came out of this thesis. So I um, spoke about looking at back jump background concepts which will help to ensure understanding of the later um, typology which I'll talk about um, in slides later on. So one of the concepts that is integral to the theory is that authorising environments um, make up the space in which public guardians have legal authority to make their decisions. So all um, public sector agencies must have legal authority. And this comes from a direct or formal environment, such as legislation or common law, but it, it also can come from indirect or informal 
environments, such as international conventions. So the authorising environment of public guardians in New South Wales actually comprises of the Guardianship Act um, of 1987, and that's the direct formal authorising environment that we're looking at today. The international authorising environment is the is Article 12 of the UNCRPD, and this is the indirect authorising environment in which guardians um, function. We're also going to look at something called both-and thinking, and this is a tool that guardians use in their substitute decision-making to, um, I guess, cross the great divide between the domestic environment and the international environment, and we'll talk about that a bit later. So within the um, domestic authorising environment, there's a common law presumption of capacity and guardians um, are appointed by the tribunal, so the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal, um, which determines whether a person lacks mental capacity. So guardians are appointed when there's a determination that a person lacks decision-making ability. And this is done on a functional assessment of decision-making ability. Um, so this is a binary approach to capacity. A person either has decision-making capacity or they don't. It's not particularly flexible. When guardians are making decisions, they must apply the general principles of the Guardianship Act, which include that the best interests of a person are paramount and that a person's views must be considered, but these are seen as secondary to best interests. Family relationships are very important and a focus is on protection from neglect, abuse and exploitation, so protection from harm. When protecting from harm, um, guardians need to use the least restrictive safeguards. And um, another background point is that orders are reviewed um, so that an order is not ongoing but only lasts for a specific amount of time before it's looked at again. Guardians see the act as antiquated, paternalistic, conservative and risk averse. And looking at, if you looking at maybe the second quote here um, epitomizes this. So Lisa said that guardians are up against a very protectionist system. It's paternalistic and quite often views people from a negative aspect first, not from a positive strength space. Um, and all guardians within the research study um, had this opinion. So looking at the next authorising environment, so the international or informal authorising environment in which guardians operate, um, Article 12 is central to the UNCRPD and it is actually the most controversial article. So there's a lot of academic debate and other debate in the sector around what key elements mean, such as legal capacity and mental capacity and their relationship. Um, also, the definitions of supported and substitute decision-making are a bit contentious, and the legitimacy of substitute decision-making happening within the ambit of Article 12 is also quite controversial. Con controversial sorry. Um, Article 12 endorses equality of legal capacity for people with disability, as mentioned before. Now, this legal capacity actually incorporates legal standing, which means that um, you hold rights. For example, you might um, have the right to own property, but it also incorporates legal agency, which is the ability to act on rights, which um, might be, for example, selling property. So legal capacity under the under Article 12 is seen as inalienable, which means that um, just by being a human being, you have these particular that particular human right. It um, endorses a universal capacity model, and that's because um, people with disability can't be singled out under Article 12 um, to so as as lacking. Um, capacity, I guess. So they have the same capacity as what other people would have. Um, under this model, legal capacity is quite separate from mental capacity, which means that uh, 
determinations of legal capacity should be distinct okay. from determinations of um, decision-making ability. So they, they should not be linked at all. Also, Article 12 um, mandates the provision of support to exercise legal capacity. And this really, um, as mentioned before, correlates to supported decision-making. <clears throat> supported decision-making under Article 12 is seen as a protection to protect the decision-making rights of someone, so not to protect them from harm. It provides for um, appropriate safeguards to prevent abuse under human rights law, but these safeguards must respect the rights, will and preferences of the person. Um, hence, the focus is mainly on decision-making rights of the person rather than protection. Um, any safeguards must be proportional to the degree to which it affects a person's rights and interests, and we'll talk about that a bit later in the typology. Um, this particular quote below is indicative of um, how people see the convention and um, it's often talked as being a paradigm shift. So this particular um, quote is from Jared Quinn and he says that Article 12 is embellished of the paradigm shift of the convention, the deceptively simple proposition that persons with disabilities are subjects and not objects sentient beings like all others deserving equal respect and equal enjoyment of their rights. So under this article, the UNCRPD um, committee actually views Article 12 as precluding substitute decision-making regimes. Um, and that's because under substitute decision-making, a legal, a legal agency is removed from a person and they... Um, they, it's done by um, a functional test that links legal and mental capacity. And as we talked about before, that um, is contrary to Article 12. The focus on, is on safeguarding protecting a person from harm in a substitute decision-making regime and not on um, the decision-making rights of the person. And decisions are made by someone else other than the person in the person's best interests. Turning to both and thinking, which is another background concept, which we'll link in with the typology later. Um, this concept is usually applied in psychology and leadership. Um, and, but I found in, in my research that this is a tool that's also used by New South Wales public guardians to help them navigate the two polarized authorizing environments, which we just talked about. So one that's very protectionist, and one that's empowering of decision-making rights for people with disability. Um, this both end thinking means that these contradictory realities can be true at the same time and that they don't have to be viewed as either or, so as right or wrong. The guardians manage the, the polarity, I guess, by using both end thinking, which means accept, accepting the paradox of those um, unaligned, I guess, authorizing environments. So guardians instinctively wonder, using both and thinking, how they can simultaneously be within the ambit of the Guardianship Act, but also apply the concepts that are in Article 12. <clears throat> And the, I guess the, the aim of the both and thinking is to deliver a less paternalistic and more empowering approach to substitute decision making. And they do this also by remaining flexible and acting strategically to reimagine a decision making context that aligns more closely with the empowerment um, ideal of Article 12. Guardians don't necessarily do this consciously, um, but in an unconscious kind of instinctive way. So that moves us on to the grounded theory that stems from my research. Um, and as I said before, it's got a bit of a convoluted title. And the grounded theory is that there's a typology of guardians' human rights substitute decision-making outcomes 
um, that explains how New South Wales guardians use this both and thinking concept to make substitute decisions within the competing domestic and international authorizing environments. And in doing so, they affect um, one of four decision-making outcome types that are within the typology. So these types um, in brief are facilitating full legal capacity. So that's one outcome type. Number two is enabling mental capacity. So that's a distinct outcome type. Number three is realizing the person's will and preferences. And number four is prioritizing harm um, prevention. So substitute decision makings of um, substitute decision making for each substitute decision will fall within one of these outcome types. <clears throat> each um, outcome type embodies key elements of Article 12 to different degrees. And these elements of Article 12 that we will look at when we discuss each typology type um, is the first one is prioritizing the support the person may require in exercising their legal capacity. So we spoke about that before. It's an inherent um, requirement of Article 12. The second one is respecting the person's rights, will and preferences. And the third one is applying appropriate and effective safeguarding to prevent the abuse um, in a least, to prevent abuse in the least restrictive manner possible. This is a very intricate <laughs> diagram, which actually just shows how each um, decision-making type, so for, for example, facilitating full legal capacity, relates to those elements that I just talked about um, in Article 12. So, for example, um, looking at type one, facilitating full legal capacity, you'll see that number one and number two um, elements actually are equal in this diagram. So this means that um, in type one, guardians um, outcomes of their substitute decision making are mo most aligned with prioritizing the support um, needed to exercise legal capacity and respecting the rights, will and preferences of a person. Whereas if you're looking at enabling mental capacity, which is type two, the main priority is respecting the rights, will and per and and preferences of a person. So you'll see that each typology has different um, alignments with the key elements of Article 12. And we'll have a look at that in more detail as we go along. Um, so if we move on to looking at the outcome types uh, individually, you can see, I, I want to discuss first, sorry, the context of each one, because that then, um, will give you kind of a fundamental of idea of how each typology, each decision um, outcome type then aligns with Article 12. It will become apparent as we talk about that. So the context to outcome one um, is that Article 12 says that equality of legal capacity is mandatory. We've already talked about that. It involves legal standing and legal agency. Um, keep in mind that the Guardianship Act actually removes legal agency because there's an appointment of a guardian um, and then a person can't actually make their own decisions. So the person no longer has full legal capacity. And the aim um, of outcome type one is for guardians to facilitate the restoration of a person's legal capacity. So um, they will work to get the person released from guardianship, which will then enable a person to have legal capacity and make decisions in accordance with their own will and preferences. So this quote links quite nicely to outcome type one. Um, Lisa says, because as soon as I met him, I figured straight away that there is no way this man should be under guardianship. So my goal then is to get him off. So guardians use both and thinking <clears throat> to champion lapses rather than make the substitute decision. And this means that they as assist the person to seek a release from the guardianship order. 
The paradox of both and both and thinking here is that they facilitate the handing back of a decision to the person so that they can make it themselves within an authorizing environment that removed legal capacity in the first place, which is the Guardianship Act. Guardians do this in two ways. So they champion lapses by acknowledging the overreach of the Guardianship Act and recognizing that a person has mental capacity and, and that there is no need for the primary safeguard of guardianship. They also do it um, in the circumstance, in other circumstances where they consider that the person's right to make a decision is, sorry, they consider the person's right to make a decision um, and to dignity of risk as outweighing their right to protection from harm. So the focus here for guardians is on the right for a person to make the decision themselves, um, even though it may actually entail risk of harm to the person. And they do this when a person's, usually do it when a person's refusing to comply with an order and when enforcing the order will actually cause more harm to them than if they were released from it. And this usually occurs when a guardian needs to um, access the help of police or the ambu or ambulance to um, forcibly remove a person from their home, for example, um, and put them into um, maybe aged care accommodation or other accommodation. Um, and in this instance, Guardians judge that the safeguard of um, protecting harm by making a substitute decision will actually be more, it's more intrusive and it will cause more harm to the person if a substitute decision make, um, is made rather than championing, championing a, a lapse and having that person make the decision for themselves. The alignment with Article 12 for Outcome Type 1 is that it most closely links to the intent of Article 12.3, which is to provide support to the person exercising their legal capacity. And that's because guardians are facilitating the person's uh, person regaining their legal capacity by assisting the person to be released from the guardianship order. The um, outcome type one also links with Article 12.4, which is respecting the rights, will, and preferences of the person. And that's because ultimately when the um, order lapses, the person then has the right to make their own decision in accordance with their will and preference. Um, no safeguarding is applied here because uh, guardians see that substitute decision making is not necessary. Um, what is integral to understanding outcome one is that guardians are not actually upholding legal full legal capacity, but they're facilitating the regaining of it. And that's because guardians themselves don't have the authority under the Guardianship Act to discharge someone from a guardianship order. Moving on to article, um, sorry, outcome type two, um, looking again at one of the guardian's quotes, Rose says, there are examples where you just, where you can just go everybody else, like it doesn't matter what you think, this person, there's still some capacity there. So why aren't we trying our best to enable it? And that really epitomizes the um, aim of enabling a person to make their own decisions under outcome two. The context to this is that legal capacity is seen as distinct from mental capacity under Article 12 and it can't be linked. However, the Guardianship Act actually conflates these so that legal capacity can be removed after an assessment of mental capacity. The aim here for guardians is to hand back decision making to the person despite the fact that they're under substitute decision making. And this is distinct from um, outcome one because when guardians are enabling a person's mental capacity, they still, uh, the person's still under guardianship. So they're not released from it as in outcome one. 
both and thinking here um, is that guardians are using the tool to create a space in which decision-making autonomy can exist even within the substitute decision-making legislation that denies it. So a guardian um, who's appointed after a functional assessment deems that someone lacks mental capacity is still allowing a person to make a decision. Um, and so they're giving back mental capacity to that person. In this way, they're decoupling um, legal and mental capacity on a very practical level, even though the legislation is actually conflating it. They do this in two ways. So um, both and thinking allows them to respect the presumption of mental capacity in the New South Wales common law, even though the Guardianship Act displaces the presumption, as we talked about in the background concepts. So in practice, guardians kind of set about to informally reassess a person's um, decision-making ability, and as such, they will reinstate the presumption of legal capacity, which reflects the ethos of Article 12. Um, and this is key to doing outcome um, type two. The paradox here is that guardians employ the presumption within a substitute decision-making structure under which it was refuted. And they do this mostly for small decisions, um, which present minimal to no risk and um, don't have significant consequences legally or financially. They also um, will find um, discrete components of more significant decisions in which they can hand back to the person for decision making. And significant decisions um, are those that are complex or contested mainly. The second way in which guardians use both and thinking under outcome type two is by endorsing the person's decision. So the Guardianship Act, um, as we talked about before, appoints a substitute decision maker. And so there's no longer any legal recognition of a person's decision making ability or the decision, any decision that they made within the ambit of the order. So in practice though, guardians will empower a person to actually make a decision even though they're under guardianship. And the paradox here is that guardians will rubber stamp a decision. So in other words, they endorse a decision that the person themselves make um, makes, and in doing so, they provide it with legal authority. So once the decision is actually endorsed, a rubber stamped, it's then valid and it can be acted on um, so the person's rights, will, and preferences are actually implemented even though um, they're under guardianship. So outcome type two, enabling mental capacity, is mostly aligned with um, Article 12.4, which is respecting the rights, will, and preferences of the person. And that's because the decision made is the decision of the person themselves. There's potentially some alignment with um, Article 12.3, which is providing um, the person with support to exercise their legal capacity. And this is because um, really what the guardian is doing by endorsing the person's decision is acting on that person's decision themselves. So really, I guess they're providing vicarious legal agency because they're handing legal agency back to the person um, and then allowing that person's decision to be actioned or carried out or implemented. Moving to outcome type three, um, which is realising will and preferences, the context to this is that decisions um, need to be made in the person's best interests. And that's a paramount consideration under the guardianship. So that's the primary consideration. A best interest test is based on a reasonable person's objective view. And so this is focused mainly on protection from harm. This isn't compliant with Article 12, which says that um, the person's will and preferences must come first. 
Under the Guardianship Act, a person's will and preferences need only be considered when a decision is being made. The aim of this um, is that guardians want to make a decision that realises the will and preferences of the person to the greatest extent possible. Um, they recognise, though, that a decision may only like closely reflect but not be identical to a decision that the person might have made. The um, both end thinking here is that guardians will enhance and reinforce a person's voice or view by recognizing them as integral to best interests. So they do this by expanding the ambit of the best interest test so that it's no longer a reasonable person test. It's no longer objective because the standard um, will actually will incorporate the person's will and preference. So the person's will and preference or the person's view becomes integral to their best interests rather than guardians just having to consider the person's view. There's a broader focus then than just protection from harm and harm is assessed then through the will and preferences lens and it doesn't always equate to accepting risk. Um, because guardians use a stepped approach to manage risk. So even though they're looking at harm through the lens of will and preference and through the lens of the person's wishes, they still may not um, endorse that person's decision because of risk that they see, risk to harm that they might see um, the person as having, I guess. So in doing this, using a stepped approach, um, they look at least restrictive safeguards and they do this under outcome type three by implementing trials quite often. So they'll trial a decision outcome and they'll step it up or down um, by um, instituting more or less safeguarding in alignment with the person's will and preference. So the paradox here is that while the outcome does not align exactly with the person's um, decision or their will and preference, it reflects the will and preference to the greatest degree possible um, within the protection focused legislation. Article 12 alignment here for outcome three is mostly with article 12 four, which is respecting the rights, will and preferences of the person. So the key here is that they actually respect the rights, will and preferences. So the person's will and preferences are taken into account. Um, they may not be upheld exactly. This also reflects the intention of Article 12.4, applying the um, most appropriate safeguards in the least restrictive manner. Um, this is distinct from outcome one because there's no intention to restore legal capacity um, because the person remains under guardianship. It's distinct from outcome two because when really realising a person's will and preferences, the guardian is still actually making a decision for the person. This is in contrast to enabling um, mental capacity, which is outcome two, in which the guardian allows the person to make the decision themselves and then endorses it. Um, safeguarding here changes from the focus on protecting a person's right to decide to respecting a person's will and preference um, while maintaining protection from harm. Outcome type four is epitomized by this quote, um, which Isaac says, I try to say to him, you do get into trouble and you'd be in jail otherwise. And he believes he thinks he'll manage really. So yeah, it's very, it's very hard. Decisions that go against people's wishes are the most difficult decisions really. This um, outcome has a context in which safeguards must be relative to the extent they affect rights, will and preference, and that's Article 12. But the UN says um, also that rights, all rights must be protected. And yet under, guardian, under the Guardianship Act, um, a focus is really on protection from harm, as we saw from the best interests test, which is objective. And it's not about will and preferences. Under the Guardianship Act, protecting all rights is really difficult when weighing them up for guardians. 
um, because as I was suggesting before, the focus is really around safeguarding a person from harm um, predominantly. So the both and thinking here is that um, as in outcome three, best interest standard is reinterpreted to um, have will and preferences as central and um, all rights are considered and balanced. So even though the principle of um, safeguarding from harm or, or best interest of the person is paramount, guardians will look at all rights as equal when they're balancing up um, in outcome four. So um, outcome four, though, is more, most likely when risk is imminent and significant and when the decision complexity increases and when um, the decision under outcome four would be more beneficial to the person's other rights, which have already been negatively affected. Also, um, guardians will continually monitor and review safeguards under um, outcome four so that stepping up and down of safeguards might still happen in accordance with will and preference. And gu guardians will always be looking out for um, ways in which a person's will and preference can be given effect. Um, so, so I guess outcome four is that a person's will and preference is not has not been given effect, but um, guardians will always monitor it to see if they can move away from um, protection of harm and more towards a person's will and preferences. So any alignment with Article 12 is um, based on the premise really that substitute decision-making does come within Article 12. Um, and it most closely aligns then with applying appropriate and effective safeguarding to prevent abuse in the least restrictive manner. It potentially aligns with the intent of Article 12.4 to respect the rights, will and preferences of the person, and that's because um, in weighing up protection um, and balancing rights, will and preference is, again, central to that question. So implications of the typology, um, it reveals that New South Wales public guardians, um, in practice, their substitute decision making is actually better aligned with Article 12 than what the text of the New South Wales Guardianship Act um, suggests. This means um, that legislative change can be better or more politically justified because it's actually seen to be um, based on or it could be seen to be based on what is already happening in practice. Um, and really legislative change would give um, the practice of guardians much more legitimacy and visibility and accountability. Um, a moderate legislative change, for example, um, might be in accordance with the typology, uh, removing the obligation of New South Wales guardians to give paramountcy to the person's best interest so that um, will and preference is included in decision-making of guardians. Um, it could actually be mandating will and preference as in the first instance. Um, and moving on, to um, an opportunity, you know, this provides an opportunity to create policy and procedural and practice change. Um, instead of leg or, or where legislative change is seen as too difficult or in conjunction with legislative change, um, the typology might, it could be embedded into policy and procedure. Um, and this would actually formalize it so that it um, its continuance is legitimate, I guess. It, it would mean that it's a constant, uniform and transparent practice. Um, and it, it acknowledges the approaches that guardians are already using to try to align um, substitute decision-making with Article 12. 
Um, on a final note, of course, change must be inclusive of the voices of people with disability. And I acknowledge that in looking at this question from the perspective of guardians, that doesn't happen in this research and that um, this needs to be done and perhaps more research can be done which focuses on how people with disability under orders actually see um, the view, how guardians uh, make decisions for them. So um, I know that was a very dense and, and fairly complicated uh, presentation. So please feel free to make decisions and hopefully I can, um, I can shed some more light on the typology. Thank you, Jenna. That was, I think that was really, really clear. The next presentation is from Charity Sims Jenkins, who's also a PhD candidate with our centre. Um, she is not far behind Jenna um, and hopefully will be finished by the end of the year or early next year. And she's going to take another perspective and look at direct support staff and their perspectives about supporting self-determination. Uh, with a focus on people with intellectual disabilities. So over to you, uh, Char Charity is a social worker rather than a lawyer, so she comes from a, a sort of different worldview. Um, so over to you, Charity. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, my presentation is direct support staff perspectives on supporting self-determination for adults with intellectual disabilities. And... Um, Sorry, because I learned how to cut it. And uh, yeah, just like uh, Chris and Jenna, I'd also like to acknowledge the tra traditional custodians of the lands we're each meeting from today, pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. And like Chris, I'm in Bundura, so um, on the lands of Wurundjeri clan of the Kulin Nation. I'm gonna start by telling you uh, about self-determination and we just um, thinking of it um, in a different way to how Jenna presented it because um, not from that legal uh, or legislative angle, but um, it's a core concept to the research I've been doing. And, and I'll say, because um, I'm looking at the disability NDIS space, an equivalent term there is choice and control. Self-determination is doing things that you want to do that come from within or inside yourself, not what other people have said to do. And this is important for psychological well-being, as DC and Ryan have shown over many years of research. We have self-determination when we're doing things based on what we want from inside. And I've drawn some um, pictures here to try to show that with the the blue circle is showing when we are wanting something from inside and those things that they're usually uh, coming from desires for personal growth, meaning and connection. Um, and when we're doing things from that place, we're more satisfied and have greater well-being. Um, the alternative way is when we're doing things because of outside forces, so from fear of punishment or threats, which is what I've used the red cloud to show, or even because of reward or recognition, and we use the gold cloud for that. If um, we're doing things for those outside reasons, we're less satisfied with reduced well-being, And that's interestingly true, even though people do go after rewards, but studies have shown that when people are offered rewards for things they were already wanting to do, being rewarded from outside undermines that and they end up being less satisfied. So, yeah, that's the way I'm thinking of self-determination. It's a theory that applies to all people, to you, me, everyone. And when we're thinking about self-determination for adults with intellectual disabilities, which um, I'm talking about, I want to get across that it's not just about independence, being able to do things by yourself. Independence is helpful for doing the things you want to do, but... I want to get across that it's more than that because self-determination is something you need to have even when you don't have the skills to be independent. And I like this definition to make that more clear by Avery and Stancliffe of self-determination as an interactional process. So it can include 
interaction with other people for um, doing the things we want to do. They say um, self-determination is when the person has the amount of independence they want for doing what is important to them. And that will change with context. So uh, sort of an example of imagining myself in a scenario to make sense of this. So if it feels meaningful for me to cook a meal for my friends and to share it with them, so being connected, but I don't know how to do that by myself, I might want to learn to do it by myself so that I could then do it any time. But while I'm learning that, I might also want to do it right now with support or to do a part of that and a support person or someone else does another part. And what's important is that what parts of doing this that I want to do and what parts I want help with are going to depend on what is important to me about the whole thing and factors of the situation, including what friends are coming to the dinner, um, other things on the day and how I feel about the person who's supporting me. So it's all very contextual. So that's um, self-determination as a core concept. And it's at the core of where I'm coming from with this, because I feel like everyone should have self-determination as much as they want and be supported to have that. And in particular, it's important for people with intellectual disabilities when they don't have enough and need support with it. And so the problem I've chosen to research is when disability support staff can inhibit self-determination for adults with intellectual disabilities instead of supporting it such as protecting people from harm or if they're assuming what the person wants in, instead of knowing what they want from their point of view. This reduces well-being for the person being supported in a way that is not intended by the support staff. It's unintentional harm. And that's something that might happen if staff are wanting to help the person but doubting their abilities to keep themselves safe. And I'm basing that on a, a theory, um, stereotype content model, but I'm not going to go into that in this presentation. My aim is to explore the perspectives of disability direct support staff about how to support adults with intellectual disabilities to have self-determination. And with this to inform the possibility of shifting perspectives towards encouraging staff to give better support for people's self-determination. So the questions I've explored are, are staff wanting to help adults with intellectual disabilities, but doubting their abilities to get things done and to stay safe, so based on the theory? Um, which staff practices demonstrate good support for self-determination? And I did qualitative interviews with 22 disability direct support staff, and with that I included some um, students of disability support related courses who had experience, and they were all attending a workshop about supporting choice and control, which is that NDIS term that aligns to self-determination. Um, um, knowing that they were all attending this workshop and willing to do interviews with me uh, tells me something about that they all already had an interest in supporting people with self-determination. And I wanna add that they all gave me um, a good amount of their time, up to two hours for each of them. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, in that interviews, I asked staff about how they would respond in vignette situations. So they're sort of sample scenarios. And I was looking for how they described what they would do to support someone in a situation to have self-determination. So, I don't know what they would actually do in practice based on how they responded to these scenarios, but what they were saying they would do tells me um, how they're thinking about what they would do in support and how to describe that and what they think needs to be included in a description. I analyzed the data using a kind of combination of methods from um, deductive qualitative analysis using also um, uh, ways of thinking and methods from grounded theory. I was looking out for things that I was expecting to see, as well as uh, things, seeing what the data could reveal to me that I hadn't been expecting. And all while doing this, I was holding in mind those concepts of self, the concept of self-determination like I've described before. So what I found is that staff did want to help, 
adults with intellectual disabilities, like I'd been looking for. They spoke about them warmly. Um, just a couple of quotes to show this. The reason I do it is because I like to see that look of wonder in their eyes. And I feel honoured that we can be part of their life and care team. And I was also looking for if staff were doubting um, whether adults with intellectual disabilities had the ability to achieve, achieve some things or keep themselves safe. And I did find that as well. Um, for example, you need to know whether he can read and write, or I probably want to know if she's capable of going into the community independently, if they're living with their parents because they're not capable of living on their own or doing particular things on their own. So... What I found this was a little different to how I was expecting it to look because it was always said in this kind of conditional way, um, maybe they could do it, maybe they couldn't, would need to check. And it was usually specific to a thing needing to be done and not general across the board, um, doubting of ability. It was, would they be able to read and write for this situation and would they be able to go out independently for this situation? And I noticed, I found that staff wanted to know about people's choices and they wanted to know it in depth because um, I'm sorry, they wanted to support people with their choices. And when they were trying to find out their choices, they were looking beyond the person's words to support, support their choices, looking beyond face value. So, um, for example, obviously a lot of them can make their choices pretty clear. But a lot of people with high needs who are nonverbal, the communication barrier can be quite challenging. And a lot of the time we do come across that the person will say they want to do this, but it isn't really what they want to do. And while they were wanting to know people's choices and support them, some of them also mentioned how in the funding system this there could be feeling constrained about what choices they could support. So even if the person themselves says what they want, it can't be supported by the staff because it's all to do with the funding. Because we work with NDIS funding, the supports that we provide need to work on the goals that are set out in the plan. Or if it is that the goals aren't actually the most accurate goals for now, for her to put together a funding review based on what her current needs are, if they did change. Okay, so next part I'm going to focus on is the question of which practices support self-determination or which practices of staff were demonstrating good support for self-determination. And I was looking out for something I could compare and I've come up with um, two types, one more supportive, one less supportive of self-determination or more aligned to supporting it. But first, I just want to go back a couple of slides and point out how staff were wanting to know people's choices in depth beyond face value, because when I first found that, it stood out to me as something that would probably be a good indicator of support for self-determination, and it, it is part of it. But I found another layer on top of this where something more than that um, is needed, and that's what I'm going to present about with the two types. So it starts with how the staff are thinking about what it is they're supporting when they're supporting choice. And the two types of, are they thinking about choice for where the person wants to get to as a goal? Or are they thinking about choice uh, in terms of how the person wants support? So I'll just describe each one. So choice for where to get to as a goal, is thinking about a result to achieve in the future and what the support or the staff is looking for when trying to understand this as a choice is they're looking for what does the person want this goal to look like when they get there. And when they're thinking of choice in terms of choice for how, then that's they're thinking of how the person wants support and that's an ongoing process. And what they're looking for is what does the person want me to do to support them and how much independence does this person want with this? 
and the different ways of thinking about choice that led to different ways that the support they described sounded. If staff were thinking about choice as supporting choice for where to get to as a goal, then the support sounded like they were getting away from the person and solving things on their behalf. And in this picture, I've tried to show like a, a person is standing far ahead saying, here's the way. If they were supporting choice for how, how the person wants support, then it sounded like more like they were staying with the person and solving things together. So this picture of people standing together and saying, what do we do from here? I'm going to demonstrate these, sorry, not demonstrate, illustrate through an example scenario. So not using exact things that people said, but just sort of characterizing what type, types of support look through what the staff did. So this is an example scenario that I gave people in the interviews of um, to think through how they would support the person. So it's John goes to a day service. He has a book with pictures of trains. He's been telling support staff that he wants to get a job as a train driver. And I'll start with what it was like when staff were supporting choice for where. They would want to, they would have their own ideas about John's goal. They would um, want to know if it's realistic and if it's safe. So can he do it? Can he do it safely? They want to know if it fits their role. Is this goal that he wants something that I would be the right person to support? Is it, would I be funded for that or is it my job? And they would want to know John's idea of his goal. What he wants that to look like. Um, for example, does he want to drive metro trains or V-line trains? How many hours a week would he want to work? And lots of other questions they want to know to get a kind of real picture of how this looks for him. And what makes support supporting choice for where, um, what makes it this type is that the support the staff gives depends on the person's goal and where they want to get to. So if the staff think the goal is not realistic, they might say, we can adjust the goal to something more achievable for John, close to his goal. He could drive the train ride for children. If the staff think that the goal isn't the type of goal their role would be right for supporting, they might say, I can't help John with this one. It's not funded. I'll refer him to an employment agency. If the staff think the goal is achievable for John, they might say, yeah, okay, I'll support John to do the assessments, learn the skills, apply for jobs. And so just the, the key way to capture all this is that when staff were supporting choice for where, they were choosing these supports based on the goal, which was chosen and identified by John but they were getting away from John to solve those steps for him. And the type of support they're choosing is based on how they're seeing the goal, if it's realistic or not. And I sort of quote there from an interview, you have to assess whether he's going to be capable of doing it. So you'd have to refer that onto an employment agency and any other allied health professional who can help with the assessments and then with this choice. And now I'll show the other type, supporting choice for how the person wants to be supported. So it starts with the same things. The staff have ideas about John's goal as well. Uh, is it realistic? Is it safe? Does it fit my role? They want to know these things. They're also looking for John's idea of his goal. Um, does he want to drive Metro or V-Line? How many hours would he want to work? They're interested in those things. But they're also coming back and looking to John to how he wants the support. And this is like a key thing. What does John want from his support? And the way that they're supporting John in, um, in this sort of orientation is that the support keeps coming back to the person. And you see these are all kind of framed as questions that you want to know from the person. If they think the goal is not realistic, then they'll come back to John and say, what does John want if the job is out of reach? How does he want to prepare for if things go badly? How does he want me to respond? And if they think it's not the kind of goal that they'd be able to support in their job, they might say, if I can't do the support John wants, does he want others involved? Is he open to an employment agency? And if they think the goal is achievable for John, they might say, 
what options will he want to see to get started? What does he want me to do? So in this one, it's always coming back to how John wants to be supported. And an example quote for this one from an interview. So you'd start with John having that sit down. Make sure he's cool for you to explore it more. Who else do you think we should get on board to help you with this goal? I've just made a table to capture all that um, in a, and compare them side by side. So when staff are supporting choice for where the person wants to get to, they're listening for the person's goal. And when they're supporting choice for how the person wants to be supported, they're listening for the person's goal and how the person wants to be supported to get to it. In supporting choice for where, support depends on the person's goal and whether it's realistic. In supporting choice for how, support is based on how the person wants support. In supporting choice for where, the person gets involved as an action taker because their staff are interested in where the person wants to get to and kind of mapping out how to get there and the person's taking those actions as independently as possible, but they've been set by the staff. And in supporting choice for how, the person is involved as a navigator. The person and staff are choosing supports together. I've made a diagram of this as well. Um, so in one side, and actually so I need to do my little annotation thing. Find that. Hope you can see this. Okay. Um, in supporting choice for where and supporting choice for how, they're both building an idea of the person's goal based on getting that information from the person. But uh oh. Okay, and the difference is how they're figuring out how to support the person. So in supporting choice for where, the how to support the person is being based on the supporter's idea or the staff's idea of the person's goal, and then that's being used to support the person. And in the supporting choice for how support type orientation, um, how to support the person is being taken from the person and then that's used to support them. And I'm just got another one summing this up again. It's supporting choice for where or supporting choice for how, supporting choice for where the person wants to get to as a goal. It's getting away from the person, planning ahead, for them the how to get to where they want to go and involving the person as an action taker. In supporting choice for how the person wants to be supported, it's staying with the person, choosing together how the support goes and involving the person as a navigator. And I'm just comparing these back to the um, concept of self-determination I described earlier remembering that it is doing things you want from inside yourself with the amount of independence you want, not what other people have said to do, then the supporting choice for where is less supportive of self-determination because it involves giving people things to do from outside. And supporting choice for how is more supportive of self-determination because it involves what the person wants yeah. the whole process of support. And I'm just going to use another scenario that was given in the interviews to show you some quotes for these. So this one is, Nancy likes to drink with her friends. She would like to go out with them to bars and clubs. She wants to get hold of more of her money for this. Okay. So in supporting choice for where, these are some quotes. What is it she likes about the bars and the clubs? Is it the loud noise? Is it the environment? Is it socialising with people and that sort of thing? What input is Nancy enjoying from that? Are there other environments she could do that as well? Similar sensory input, but a different social activity that might take the focus a bit more of drinking from what the bar might have. 
and there could be another entertainment where her and her friends can meet and it's under a more of a controlled environment. These are both the kind of thinking of it as too much. And in supporting choice for how, these are some quote examples, helping her explore the options and being realistic about the pros and cons and what is and isn't possible. She might go to swimming twice a week and she might be prepared to give up the swimming so she can go out with her friends and have a drink more often. And supporting Nancy to learn about the risks that are involved. When you did drink too much, you actually missed out on hanging out with your friends. Or if she has drunk too much, how can we support her to recover from that? And my conclusions. It matters how staff are looking at choice, whether they're seeing it as a where the person wants to get to as a goal or how the person wants to be supported. And when staff are focusing mainly on the person's goal as a where to get to, they may be missing cues from the person about how they want to be supported with that. And the responses in the interviews align mostly to the supporting choice for where to get to as a goal. Um, the difference between these two ways of supporting, it doesn't depend on staff doubting competence. It's more how they're responding to that and what they're looking for. Um, supporting choice for how the person wants support is more aligned to self-determination. So we need this to be made clear when asking staff to support choice, not just to give people choice over where to get to, but choice over how to be supported with that and how it gets done. Um, and for that, we need to work through complexity around what would help staff support people to have choice over how they're supported when they're seeing their job in the NDIS to be about goals and where to get to. Um, and I am wondering if uh, Jenna's both and thinking might come into play there, but as well, I think maybe, you know, something about what's expected as well. But anyway, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charity. Well done. That was really interesting. And people will look forward to seeing that written up, hopefully, soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, as I said before, the presentations will be available on, on our website uh, early by early next week, the recordings of both the presentations. If you want the slides or if you want to contact us, you can do that through the email address that you got the link from or looking at our website. Um, I'm not sure at this point whether we'll have a seminar or not in November because there's a lot of other things happening in November, but we'll we'll let you know um, in, a, in a week or so about the next seminar. So thanks very much everybody for coming. Thanks again to our two presenters, Charity and Jenna. Okay.